All right, guys, welcome back to Rough Cut Faith. Uh, a little bit different of a setup this week. Uh, Scott will not be joining us, um, but we are marching forward. Guys, happy Holy Week. It is at this point, as you guys are watching this, um, most of the way through Holy Week, and we are looking at this weekend's um, services as... Um, kind of a, a climax of sorts to mm -hmm. not just, you know, this, this, you know, crescendo of Easter, which yeah. technically by, by, by the, the calendar standards, Easter season goes through to, to Pentecost, but, you know, mm -hmm. the kind of this fever pitch of Easter, but also wrapping up, uh, the, Matthew. the living kingdom yeah. and Matt and time in Matthew. Mm -hmm. Um, so as you're as you're you're looking at the course ahead there's got to be some mixed feelings right like oh, with yeah. with this idea of yeah. we've been doing this for so long mm -hmm. that there's got to be some some measure of okay it's time to bring this chapter to a yeah. close and look forward to something new but also mm -hmm. like this air of familiarity of like this is where we've been for like the, all of this stretch of time yeah. I, I'm going to miss Matthew a lot. Yeah. Like it's, man, I think this was the 68th hmm. sermon in the Living Kingdom series. Yeah. And we have also done 25 weeks, 23 weeks, just in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. So it's a, we've spent so much time in Matthew in the last couple of years. Mm -hmm. It's uh, we've had breaks in there with different things like Advent and then the belonging series, the post-Advent belonging series. But I am going to miss, um, honestly, I think I'm going to miss most the Matthew's voice. Yeah. It's, it's been so interesting um, and comforting to, to hear how Matthew writes. Yeah. Um, it's, I've never had this happen before um, with, a, with a book of the Bible. Um, maybe Ecclesiastes, just because it's my favorite one. But I, I've never had it happen before where uh, Matthew's become almost like a beloved author. Mm -hmm. There are authors I read that I just love how they write. So yep. I always will, I just pick up their books and read it. Mm -hmm. um, Lewis and, and Tolkien are that way. And, uh, and Stephen Lawhead is that way. They're just, I love their voice and their writing. And Matthew has become an author that whose voice I love. Yep. And so it feels like, oh, I want to read more by Matthew. Yep. <laughs> you know, is there anything else that he wrote that I can read? <laughs> right. right. But the so yeah, there's a lot of there's like some deep um, some some deep emotional feelings going away from Matthew that yeah. just are personal to me. Yeah, it's it's a little surreal to hear somebody else say that because I went through when we wrapped the Matthew series and sh uh, and and we shifted gears hard yeah. over into Esther. Mm. Um, but yeah, there is this there is this feeling of like there are certain I think there's certain sections of scripture that can just serve as kind of a security blanket mm -hmm. of of sorts. Like mm -hmm. this is this is warm, this is familiar. I know yeah. this. Um, and, and f for me, I'm right there with you that Matthew is, is that, because mm -hmm. I think just the way that it showcases Jesus and yeah. the way yeah. that it, it lays out the timeline of events that it's, it's this, this roller coaster ride of storytelling mm -hmm. the whole mm -hmm. way that I think that in, in my opinion, the rest of them, while they are maybe more comprehensive, mm -hmm. um, maybe a little bit more fully historical, are not, they don't capture that same essence yeah. of yeah. Let's, let's, let's paint a picture, let's tell a story, and all the while unpack who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So heading into this weekend, um, where are your sights? You know, I know that you guys have been since stepping back into Living Kingdom, mm -hmm. um, going more of a route of okay, 
we're going to pick up the pace. We're, yeah. we're, we're hitting the gas and, and we're going to go through the beats of the story. Mm -hmm. And so in the midst of looking at the beats of the story and all of that, and you have these two, these two mammoth days on the Christian calendar, yeah. Yeah. where does your mind go? as you start to prepare what it looks like to lead folks into a posture of worship mm -hmm. with focusing on, okay, Friday, we're focusing on Friday, mm -hmm. and then Sunday, we focus on Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I, I think uh, for me, it's always been very strange uh, growing up to hear sermons on the crucifixion. Um, because it's going so many different directions. So there's like the, there's the one message that I've heard that focuses on all of the gory details. Yep. Like here's what flogging looked like and here's what a cat of nine tails looked like and this is what it would have been and this is how painful it would have been and here's the physical um, experience that Jesus would have gone through being nailed to a cross and they get all into these details. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's harrowing, but it's not, I guess it didn't draw me in anywhere. Mm -hmm. it, it, I don't feel like the crucifixion was meant to be a medical um, explanation. No. And, and so there's, there's that part. And then, so if you get away from that, then it's like just telling the story. Mm -hmm. And what are you supposed to take from the story of a man's torture and death. Right. Um, so, I've n I've we've always kind of shied away from making the crucifixion a a sermon mm -hmm. um, and the experience of Jesus um, during that that time, what some would call the Passion. That those um, the stations of the cross, perhaps that the things that we see happening from the time of his arrest to the time of his death, uh, it moves on in the sequential manner and everyone kind of has an idea of what that looked like and what it feels like. And, um, uh, but we don't, I don't think there's a lot of value. This may be controversial. I don't think there's a lot of value in preaching through that part. Yeah. Um, but I think that it's meant to be felt. Mm -hmm. it's, it's written in a way that's meant to be, like to take you as a reader into this experience. And every gospel author is showing you little vignettes, little pieces of the story of what happened here. Mm -hmm. And so what we do um, for Good Friday is we have a Good Friday service, but it doesn't look anything like a regular service. It's it's meant to be experiential. Yep. It's not meant to be exegetical. It's right. not meant to be explanatory. It's meant to just, here is what happened, and to bring people into the experience of watching a beloved person go through um, the horrors of what Jesus went through without being too explicit. So I'm not putting stills of the passion up as images or anything, right. um, it's not image heavy either. It's more, it's, it's scripture and then it's music mm -hmm. responding in a lot of ways. I try to craft it in such a way that we are reading scripture and then responding to that in music. Yeah. Um, sometimes the songs reinforce what happened. Sometimes they look ahead at what's going to happen, but it kind of works. I really hope that the, the scripture and the music works together to create one coherent whole experience yep. um, with then communion, taking of communion together as, as a central part of that. Right. I, um, so a, a little bit of, of story time with the saints here. Um, I, we are now at the point where I have been um, a part of the Grove for over a year. So I can look back to last year's mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Good Friday and rolled around and I was like, okay, I'm involved, so I should be there, but I don't want to be there because mm. I don't like Good Friday services mm -hmm. because they're just 
so stinking depressing. They're just so like, I guys, I have. Why would I, it be depressing? Right. I mean, come on. I, I've I, I've been to everything that's supposed to be like a mock funeral service oh, to yes. just sitting in just, you feel so heavy. It's not, there's a difference between contemplative and depressing. Yeah. And a lot of times in my experience, services will by, bypass contemplative entirely and just go to, no, you have to feel like garbage after mm-hmm. you leave this because Jesus died yeah. and all of that. It's and manipulative. It, yeah. yeah. There's a difference between leading somebody and emotional manipulation. Mm-hmm. And that being said, I think there's power in being able to experience the full the full breath of Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That mm-hmm. quiet period in between where it's like yeah. everything's like sitting on a hushed whisper, mm-hmm. like what happens next sort of, sort of thing. And there, so there's power in all of that. But I remember last year, I'm like, I'm, I'm taking in the service. And I'm like, okay, this is literally just designed to lead people in a worship event Mm -hmm. like a worship experience Mm -hmm. through the lens of this is part of the story. Yeah. And I, I, I'll meet your, your, your controversial statement with, with another controversial statement. I think as a movie, as a, as a standalone showcase, not from the pulpit, Mm -hmm. but as its own thing, I think there's value in that, part of the passion of the christ mm-hmm, mm-hmm. now you say what you will yep. about the director and all that i understand yep. the movie has its controversy and all yep. of that kind of stuff absolutely but walking through a depiction of that i think can have its merit in certain situations in certain circumstances yep. i'm actually at a point in my life personally where like Yes, since having to, having my my come to Jesus moment, I have sat down and I have watched that. Mm-hmm. And yes, it is powerful. Mm-hmm. Do I need to watch it every year? No, no. I do not. Yeah. I've watched it. Cool aces, but you know, I, I don't need to keep revi- keep revisiting it. Um, but I, but I would always say that that is separate from walking through in a worship setting. Yeah what it means to acknowledge Friday in lieu of Mm -hmm. acknowledging Sunday. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I don't, I found the the film to be a moving, Mm -hmm. like a a deeply personal and moving experience. Um, But I think that is, uh, that's a good, (laughs) that's a good distinction between what we want to accomplish as a group. Mm -hmm. Um, it was deeply personal and moving for me. I watched it in a theater. I don't care what anyone else was feeling. Yeah. There are, you know, 150 other people there. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter. I didn't know them. They were all strangers. Right. <laughs> That's different. It, what, what I don't, I don't want that for a church. This is a community. Yep. This is not a, this is not a group of strangers yep. getting together. This is something that I desire all of us to be experiencing in roughly the same way. Yeah. Nobody's going to have the same experience. Yeah. But to have something communally oriented um, that draws us together and focuses all of us on the same thing, mm-hmm. that's what I think is is powerful about it. I think, and I, I, I don't know if, if, you know, in the grand design of looking at Living Kingdom into advent into post advent into easter season that there was this connective tissue or if this is just like it, it, this this worked out all really well mm-hmm. but we have this runway of looking at a variety of different aspects of what it means to be a community of belonging, to be a community of God's people, to be together in all of the, in looking at the different layers of the onion when Mm -hmm. it comes to community and all of the different forms that it can take. And it's all, it's, it's this, this, this emphasis has been on 
doing life together mm -hmm. as a body of believers and then Easter. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Yep. And, yep. and I think, I think you're onto something that's, that's, that's incredibly significant and something that, that I think is incredibly, uh, vital mm -hmm. when, when expressing, when having an expression of worship centered around Easter. Because it can very easily become, and I, I made this, I made this joke that, mm -hmm. that this, this uh, on on one of my shows that for those of you in a local con a local context, who knows? Maybe I'll maybe I'll throw everybody for a loop, and I'll come on Sunday in a suit with my hair pulled back in a ponytail, <laughs> and I won't be wearing a hat. <laughs> Don't hold your breath. But Stranger Things. Yeah. Um, <laughs> But but it can very easily become oh this is the this is the the week that we that we dress up and this is the week yeah, yeah. and whatever if you if you come to I'm, please Sonja uh, like if if you come dressed up and all that kind of stuff awesome I always wear my nice jeans <laughs> Easter the good the good flannel the, the comes good flannel out. Uh, <laughs> maybe I'll wear different shoes ooh, ooh, <laughs> and boots um, but but you know it can very easily become about other things. Yeah. And I think if I think if we understand that we are all coming together on Friday as a group mm -hmm. and we're all coming together on Sunday as a group, as a community mm -hmm. that that's when the weightiest parts of all of this are are can can really be be processed, I think. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that just as you mourn, you feel the individual, as an individual, you feel the mourning um, and you grieve, but a community, you want the community around you. There's, mm -hmm. a, there's a sense of um, communal grief that mm -hmm. is comforting. And I think that when we focus on Good Friday in such an individualistic way, here's what Jesus did for you type of thing, mm -hmm. you should feel really bad about this. That's yep. always the, that's the, like your experience, that's the sense of you're, you're miserable and you, you made Jesus do this type yep. of thing, um, which we didn't make Jesus do anything, he chose to do it. So, the, but, but we have, I think this, the power in this particularly is in the fact that we've spent so much time in Matthew learning about Jesus, mm -hmm. seeing him, understanding his humanity, understanding who he was and his motivations and the love and care and compassion that he had for people. And so um, I, don't, I know not everyone will feel this way, but I know for me, I have gotten to know Jesus better mm -hmm. as I've studied Matthew, as we've walked through it together, and to now come to Good Friday and say, this is what happened to your friend. Yep. Um, and the, the sense of communal grief yep. <laughs> over, um, over what he experienced and, yep. and then being there together to all feel that together, um, I, think there, I think there's power in it. Yeah. And, and it's, what, it's one of the few times where lament is, everybody agrees that lament is, is appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. I, there, there is an ability to be able to feel grief and wait without the need of um, guilt-based theology or guilt-based teaching. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think that's one of those aspects of the holiday that has become so normative mm. mm -hmm. that there there may in fact be somebody watching this that's like i've never heard it referred to as guilt or mm. guilt based mm -hmm. but man that seems really familiar that mm. i've been told that jesus did this because of me that yeah. i was the one and and the, and all of that kind of stuff and that's why i don't i'm not a huge fan of all of the various forms of imagery that we have that say that state things like you are the one that mocked jesus from yeah. the crowd you are the one who drove the nails into his hands mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff 
Do I, do I understand where those, are where those are coming from? To an extent, sure. I understand the, the, the kernel of truth that's baked into all of that. Do I think it's beneficial or necessary? No, I don't. I don't think it helps anything. No, I don't. Yeah, it, uh, but there is a theology that depends on people feeling miserable. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have to, it's like that idea that you have to feel so miserable about yourself. Yeah. Or you're not really saved. Yep. You didn't really get it. Yeah. You don't um, feel it enough in your. Yeah. 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 You, you you haven't felt guilty enough. Yeah. And so you you yeah. It's I grew up with a lot of that, and that mm -hmm. I don't think it's I, even in talking about it. It's like oh, is it sacrilegious or not? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Because yeah. I everything I see as I study scripture takes me away from that way of thinking. Um, but it's so deeply ingrained in my heart that I'm like, oh, I really feel like I should feel more yeah. guilty. And that's, and maybe it's that fear that's still speaking, but I feel like I have to offer that disclaimer of, no, yeah. I do recognize there's guilt. I do recognize what, yeah. um, that there was separation. Um, and I think that that's a biblical concept, that there was separation between us uh -huh. and God. Um, but I don't walk. Ar I don't want to walk around as this wretched sinner yep. who just barely squeaked in because Jesus took God's wrath. Right. Like that. That's a completely different theology than what I what I have now. Yeah. There's there's this concept, and we've talked about it before on Rough Cut, called the Imago Dei. Mm -hmm. And for those of you that don't know, that just means image bearer. It's just a way of saying saying that we are image bearers. Of God, and there's there's discourse, there's back and forth about what exactly that means. Is it because we have a spirit? Is it because that we we have will, or or what have you? Um, but we we are a reflection of the Creator, and when we go into that aspect of you, you need to feel like. A piece of dirt you yeah. need to feel lower than anything and God reached down and and all of that there's there's a difference between acknowledging the realities that we need that we need mercy and grace and all of that stuff like that and forgiveness of, of our sins and and all of that yes there there is that is an aspect of it but when that gets so overblown then you get straight to the point of you are standing in opposition to what the scriptures say is true mm -hmm. because it speaks something very specific to the image bearer. And if we go into it with this idea of we need to just feel bad about all of this, then, then we are, we are in contrast mm -hmm. to that. Mm -hmm. And it, it wasn't until um, I, I didn't realize it at, at first why, like I would I would talk about some of these things, and it just it 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 seemed like it was it was just firing for me in mm. certain areas, mm -hmm. where for others there was that weight that you're talking yeah. about that pull because of where they how they had uh, grown up or yep. what context yep. they come from or any of that, and I realized that as a, as a pastor, I sit in a weird spot because I don't mm. come from that. Mm. I don't mm. come from that background yeah. of that, 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 that generational, you have to feel bad about all of this in order to really feel that. So for me, I'm just left with, well, what does scripture say? Yeah. <laughs> and if I don't have any of that, if I don't uh -huh. have any of that uh -huh. influence, then you're just left with, this is what scripture says about yeah. being an image bearer, about the death, about the burial, about the resurrection, mm -hmm. and all of this kind of stuff. And part of that is walking folks through a recontextualization of these events that focus more on the active choice that Jesus made mm -hmm. and less about blaming the reader for being the reason why all that it, happened. It's, it's almost like uh, you made me do this. Yep. Like that's the reading it from that other perspective mm. is like it's it is a blame thing yeah you read the gospels and you read the account of christ's crucifixion 
and it's like this huge finger pointing at you like mm -hmm. wouldn't have had to do this if you weren't such a miserable wretch yep um where i think that that's that's such a sad that's such a sad way to look at god yep and it's i would <laughs> bordering on blasphemous a complete misrepresentation of who he is um and i think it part of that comes from our our theology of humanity starting in Genesis 3 instead of Genesis 1. That's a really good um, point. We, it's, it's like we don't pick up until the fall. Yeah. And then we go from there. Well, there was innocence mm -hmm. for we don't know how long, but that's what it looked like. Yeah. It was innocence. It was vulnerability. Mm -hmm. It was peace with God. It was joy with God. Um, and I, I feel like that if we can see that something broke mm -hmm. in between Genesis 2 and 3, and it was in that breaking that moved us in the direction we are, um, that then Christ was the restoration of what was mm -hmm. broken. It, it, if, we don't, if we start with 3, then Christ came because he had to, and we made him do it. Um, it was our wretchedness that mm -hmm. made him do this. But if we start earlier then it was Christ came to restore something that was originally intended to be beautiful. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's when when you can when you can pick up from the beginning and take in the whole story, then you understand that even even at the beginning there's already a context mm -hmm. for the kingdom of God. There's already context yeah, yeah. for love and mercy and grace when you when you start at 1 and move your way to 3. Yes, there's there's not a lot of physical real estate there in the number of pages between 1 and 3, but in order to really understand the heart of God that's on display even though there was a breaking, even though there was a separation of wills taking place there, then you get to look past the the the, the age-old debates mm -hmm. of uh, that center around that section of scripture and and focus in on what are these what are these stories telling me about god mm -hmm. Why, how are these reflecting god's interaction with man yeah. what are they yep. telling me about these different situations and then you can see oh hey already god is showing that Guys, okay, so 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 you did this, you had the will to do this, and and I'm going to remain constant yeah. in yeah. all of that. And ours is the only belief system that gets to say any of, of, right. of those things. Yeah. And yeah. when we make anything not the thing, we're robbing ourselves mm -hmm. of the ability to be the only belief system yeah. that doesn't center around a theology that's based around some angry deity yeah. that's yeah. imperfect himself yep. and is just waiting for us to mess up. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. like the resurrection is not about telling the story of, oh, God now loves you. Yeah. It's yeah. about telling the story that God has always God's loved you, always loved you. Exactly. and now through yeah. Jesus, you know that. Yeah, yeah, and, and you don't have to, you don't have to earn this. Right. Like that's, um, I mean, there's so much to go back to Genesis. The all of the creation accounts in different cultures usually have a very impersonal God. Mm -hmm. That creation of humanity like happens like god sneezes and his saliva like sunk into the earth and a person sprung forth like yeah. there's there was no other creation accounts whether it was phoenician or syrian or egyptian or any of those cultures that were around there um this was the only creation account where god formed humanity mm -hmm. where he actually and that was the whole purpose of saying from the dust it was like it was the care. It was like the sculpting. Yeah. That was so God. God sculpted each person, mm -hmm. and he he didn't. It wasn't accidental. He meant to do it, and then he gave them his own life. Mm -hmm. It wasn't an accident. He purposefully breathed life into them, and they became a living being. Mm -hmm. And going back to that Imago Dei, they they became the image of God. Whereas every other culture you had to sculpt an image of the God, right. and then 
then you could worship. Now you knew what that God looked like, and you worshiped that God. Um, this was the only story where God sculpted his own yeah. image. Yep. Nothing else was like that. Yeah. So this was like mind-blowing to, to an early Near Eastern mindset. Yeah. This was, nothing was like this, that you didn't, the people didn't sculpt the God. It was the God who sculpted the people. Right. And they were meant to be his image yeah. on earth. And they were meant to do the things that he did. Um, that's why there was, that was why the first command um, or the second command is having no graven images, mm -hmm. no representation of God at all, because he already did it. He yeah. already made his own image yep. and gave it and said, here, be me, be my image here. Yeah. And that, so it was blasphemy to think of something else right. happening. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when, so as you're, as you're, you're navigating what all of this uh, what like you know you you are in charge of of leading the worship experience mm -hmm. for a whole group of people and and you know the, you know the trip right yeah the, yeah the 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 two times a year that are generally the highest attended um, services and mm -hmm. and all of that kind of stuff so one of the things that that crossed my mind in thinking through what like trying to put myself into into mm -hmm. into your shoes right because mm -hmm. i can speak from my uh, from my context and my yeah. experience with easter my experience with shepherding people there around this holiday mm -hmm. and all of those kinds of things but it's different and that's kind of been the 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 thesis statement of the last year mm -hmm. of us working together yeah. Yeah. is that this is a different context mm -hmm. and so you are you have friday that's its thing Sunday that it's its thing. Mm -hmm. And the whole time you're building towards life continues. Yeah. Past Sunday. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like Monday Monday is a thing. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. and we shouldn't forget about the the everything that we've drawn up to just because okay, now it's not Easter anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And especially because it's not like we it's not like in this context there's um, there's a following of the liturgical calendar yeah. or anything like right, that. Right. So you're not just like, okay, now next is Pentecost, and then mm -hmm. you're kind of going through the beats of the calendar year in a yep. in a way that leads back to Easter season. Yeah. So so where where is your mind in being able to help people differentiate? Okay, now is the time that we together collectively. Um, embrace corporate suffering, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which is its own concept yeah. of unpacking what it looks like to to mourn collectively. That there shouldn't be an expectation that we are mourning individually, and and that that can go into its own its own thing. But that to 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 embrace that, but then also embrace a real sense of corporate celebration. Mm -hmm. All in mm -hmm. the same, all in the same way that yeah. moves people to life outside of just celebrating Easter. Mm -hmm. um, well, one of the ways, and this, this is intentional, and it may surprise people that it's intentional. Mm -hmm. um, I don't treat an Easter service all that different from a regular Sunday. Right. Uh, we don't have special music. We don't have different songs that we sing. We don't. Um, I occasionally wear a tie <laughs> and my nice jeans, like I said. So the expectation, yeah. of course, is it's a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but I don't, I purposefully don't do a bunch of different things on Easter mm -hmm. because I don't want it to feel all that different from the rest of life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we will celebrate and focus exclusively um, almost exclusively on the resurrection of Christ, yeah. because that is the linchpin of our faith. Right. If Christ didn't resurrect, then this is all useless. Yep. There's no reason to keep doing this. Yep. Um, so we'll focus on that, and that's really important. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't like it's not any different than a Sunday in July when we will reference the resurrection of Christ right. and how we are supposed to live in light of the resurrection of Christ. Right. So 
it's, it's a weird place. It's a really weird place because I am like, I recognize the cultural expectation of it being the Super Bowl of church. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there, there has to be a little nod to that. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, I really try hard to pull it back into this is, we celebrate the resurrection all the time. Right. Like th- it's not just today that this is important. Right. And so I, and I think where Scott typically goes in his message is like, keep living this. We live in this resurrection. And I believe he's going to go in that direction of what we call the Great Commission. And because mm-hmm. um, that's at the end of Matthew and we're wrapping up Matthew and right. it's the resurrection is this thing that happens like, boom, here. Yeah. But then there's more <laughs> after yeah. the resurrection. Yeah. And Jesus kind of saying, here's how you live now. And I really feel like that's the, the crux of it is to focus on what happens next. Yeah. Um, how do we live each day? Yeah. In light of the resurrection. I think that's the, one, one of the things that, that fascinated me about the end of Matthew when, when really taking it in, right? Like all of these different threads are all kind of coming together in, in the, the, the crucifixion. And, you know, the, for this historical th- threads and spiritual mm-hmm. threads and all this stuff is happening. And Jesus comes back. And it's kind of like a almost anticlimactic mm. in a way <laughs> yeah, yeah. because yeah. like, yeah, no, I, I, to, I told you this was, was going to Okay. So, happen. so yeah. we, this has now happened. <laughs> we've, we've talked about this. Okay. So now what do we do now? Uh-huh. And that's, and, and that I think is why, I mean, the great commissions in, in it's significant for a variety of reasons, mm. but the Great Commission plugged into the story, plugged into everything that has happened up until that point of, okay, yeah, mm-hmm. we've we have now crossed this across yep. this point. Yeah. Now is where where now is where what you do next. Yeah. Now keep keep moving forward, uh-huh. and uh-huh. that kind of that that forward momentum. Mm-hmm. He's just just as present with with how Jesus addressed yeah. that. Yeah, and I I think it's interesting you brought that point up about the anticlimactic nature. Yeah, um, Matthew really treats it like that. Yeah, like Jesus wasn't even there in the tomb. Like Matthew doesn't give us this, and then these things happened, and the lights blew out the tomb, and the angels appeared, and yeah, it, it's like. Peter and John ran to the tomb yeah. and looked in, and Jesus was gone. Yep. At, oh, <laughs> okay. Mary was at the tomb, and Jesus was gone. We don't even see the resurrection, and right. we don't we don't get to experience this climactic event. Um, we get to experience the aftermath of it, of Jesus yep. just popping up. Hey, Mary, it's me. Hey, guys, I'm here. Yep. Look at look at the nail holes. And then he pops over here. Oh, hey, Thomas, <laughs> yep. I'm back. Um, Just need to prove it to you, I guess, apparently. And then pops up, like he just kind of pops up, but it's, it's very, it's, it's not our Western storytelling sensibilities. Right. Where this linchpin of a moment is almost purposefully underplayed as, well, of course it was going to happen. Right. We all knew that. And I think to, to go back to the earlier point of so much of these, the, this last section of Matthew was centered around this idea of how did people react? What is yep. the reaction yep. to everything? Yep. I think that's exactly what we're it's, seeing. It's the it's same the, thing after the resurrection. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. How did his followers react to his death? How did his, his followers react to seeing him again? How did they, and again, I, I, I don't think it can be stated enough that in order to be really significant and see its full display of power and magnitude and majesty and grandiose nature, it doesn't need to be big and Mm -hmm. bombastic Mm -hmm. and grandiose in nature. What it needs to do is it needs to convey the humanity of it all, the lived in nature of it all. The fact that what we are seeing is the reaction of folks that walked with this man, who depended on this man, Mm -hmm. and this man was taken and publicly murdered. Yeah. And now they don't know what happens Mm -hmm. next. Mm -hmm. And acknowledging the humanity of all of that in juxtaposition of the understated divinity of Jesus in all of it and the constant 
doesn't need to be like yelling from the rooftops, but just is a constant mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. Jesus, then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> this is this is the payoff. This might not be the payoff that in the West the West we think that we want, mm -hmm. but this is the payoff that we need yeah. in order yeah, yeah. to really sink our teeth into, okay, now moving forward, now the next day and mm -hmm. the next day mm -hmm. and the next day, how do we live in a way that brings life? Yeah. How do we yeah. live as fully functioning citizens mm -hmm. of the kingdom of God? Mm -hmm. and, and Jesus just very clearly says, go and keep doing the things I've been doing. Yep. Like, it's no more, it's no, it's no more complex than that. Right. It, it's just, and I, and I think it's Matthew just saying, I just gave you all the things that Jesus said. Mm -hmm. Like, so Jesus just goes, read this again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> go, go back now, read this again. Um, obviously not saying exactly that, but that's, that's what it is. It's how do you live it? Well, go read this again. Yeah. Um, just do the things that I've been doing. Yeah. You mean the healing stuff? Well, you know, <laughs> if you, if maybe, <laughs> You mean the loving stuff? Yeah, definitely. De definitely that. 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 Definitely yeah. that. That's that you can do without any, you know, you'll need supernatural help for that. That's mm -hmm. why I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. But, uh, yeah. you know, uh, the love is more important than the healing. So, yeah. so focus on that. And, and for those that are, that are given to uh, some of the, the conversations that arise beyond Easter into Pentecost and the Holy Spirit and all of the buffet of stuff that we we'll, won't get into here and now. Um, I think if you're able to hold on to the thread mm. of the consistency of Jesus mm -hmm. and the personhood of Jesus reflecting the heart of God yeah. and yeah, yeah. and this this approach of just keep doing what you were called to do and then understand that from that point you are reading a contextual work I think mm -hmm. if you allow for those to lead you, yeah. then you can avoid, I would dare say, 80 to 90% of the traps. And yeah, I think the yeah. other 10 to 20% just comes with grab a, a, a dictionary or a help or something yeah. and, and be able to do some word study. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, in some ways, sometimes I feel like pastors and maybe Bible teachers, um, seminary professors. It's an industry. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, all of those people within their context need to feel justified in, in having arguments. Yeah. Like, you, you need me in order to have this argument. Um, if we simplified what it meant to follow, what it means to follow Christ, mm -hmm. um, some people would be out of a job. Yes. And... And I don't mean that with any ill intent or any maliciousness or anything like that. Just, just the, I feel like that's the reality of we, there seems to be times where we create problems in order mm -hmm. to be the ones that get to solve it yep. or at least get to argue about solving it. Yep. Um, but I don't think that Jesus or Paul or Peter or John um, in writing epistles mm -hmm. are all that complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, if, if I can, if I can show a little bit of, of my experience base here outside of just, um, a church context, um, and I had the ability, um, to jump into the, um, the Christian marketing world mm. and all of that, um, by trade, I am a, I, I, what I do, I do, um, marketing and all of that. And, um, I thought I was like, yeah, let's, that, this is awesome. Like, mm -hmm. this is, I get, to, I get to use my talents in a way that promotes something Christian. Yeah. And then I, I, I still to this day remember the, the conversation where, we, where something came across where a, a, a client wanted to promote something that just took wild swings. Well, just, mm -hmm. I don't need to, we don't need to go into any of the specifics, but it just took wild swings with biblical content. And I had said, yeah, we can't, like, we, we <laughs> yeah. can't, like, this is, and, and like, but their money spends and this will sell. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it's like that. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's 90% marketing with a, with, with a, with a Christian tint yep. and yep. all of that. And I'm not, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus. I'm not trying to like, mm -hmm. whatever, like I'm not, I'm not, this is not meant to be a scathing indictment. Just 
because I'm sure that there are people who have a genuine heart for only promoting things that are theologically accurate and all of those kinds of things. But this aspect that we're addressing absolutely exists. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, just a, it's just a part of it. And mm-hmm. so that's, that, that industry wants to perpetuate mm-hmm. these different divisions on should we do exactly this or exactly that? Should Easter be this big set apart yeah. bombastic event mm-hmm. and i guess i'm just left asking the question is if that's not how the man who died and rose again addressed it <laughs> yeah then why? maybe not maybe not maybe, maybe not. that's not the way to do it okay mm-hmm. so how did he and yeah. and yeah so I, I all of that tongue in cheekness to say i'm right there with you mm-hmm. that I think it is important to just keep it like focused on mm-hmm. on the big picture, and that involves how do you move forward from yeah. that point. Yeah, yeah. I I certainly don't want anyone to walk away and go, oh, all these churches that are making a big deal out of it are missing the mark. No. Um, I think that they're they're doing what they believe is best. Yeah. Um, but I I do I just think for our community for this body, when I look at the Easter season, I don't. I look at it as like I look at communion every month. Yep. We need to bring it back around. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's got to come back around. We have to talk about it. We have to put it back into the forefront of our minds yep. to see it for the significance that it is. Um, but there's 51 other weeks of the year yep. that we also come back together. And I I love it that we have, you know, we'll have this place will be full on Sunday. Yep. Um, Easter is our largest attended service Mm -hmm. um that's fine and that's great but i really really want people to uh experience and live for (laughs) live the resurrection yeah all throughout the year yeah and so i'm also i'm more focused on the other 51 weeks yeah or i'm just as focused on easter as i am the other 51 weeks because i think they're all significant and it's important for us all as a community to to come together and worship. Yeah, yeah. And and for those of you that that are watching that um you know th- this is this is something that we've kind of gone a little outside of the paradigm of where we would normally go because we wouldn't necessarily focus on commenting on how any other church or group or yeah. whatever does elects to have their expression of worship. Please understand that what we are talking about is completely focused on the expression of worship for the grove, mm-hmm. not and and how first church of whatever does it, or this church over here does it, or that church over there does it. That's their context. Yeah. That's their group. That's 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 not for us to comment on. It's just the perspective of the folks that pastor and shepherd this body of believers. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, yep. guys, hopefully you are having an amazing uh, Holy Week, and, and thank you guys for joining us. Um, we hope to see you on Friday. Um, I will go out on a limb and speak for the team and say um, Friday is experiential. You use that yep. word, and yep. we've used that word off air. Um, it, it is meant to be lived in with the people. Now, the digital guy is saying that, so it might be, so it must mean something. <laughs> but but that's one of it's one of those times that collectively we are we are worshiping together. Um, so that's that's going to be different. Easter will be back to normal. It'll be streamed. It'll be a mm-hmm. thing. Um, so so we're, our our hope is that if you are within the ecosystem of the Grove in a local context, that come celebrate, come engage, all of those kinds of things this uh, the, this weekend. Um, and if you're not, come and, and, and engage online on Sunday and and just just the same. And and you will you are welcome and all of those kinds of things. As always, if you have any questions in regards to uh, anything that we've talked about here, um, you know we did talk about some some controversial hot takes and all of that about how the Grove decides to um, express worship during the season. So if 
you have any questions about that, feel free, drop a comment. Um, we watch those even past after, after it goes live. We appreciate hearing from you guys or feel free to come and have a conversation with us um, after the service. So guys, thank you. And uh, if we don't uh, talk to you on Sunday, have a happy Easter. Happy Easter. Mm -hmm.